Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Meet the Author series event with the Gwinnett County Public Library. I'm Laura Dobbins, the supervisory librarian here in our beautiful new Norcross branch. We hope that you have time to look around before our event, but if not, we hope you'll be back again. Before we begin, I'd like to cover some logistics for the evening. This program is being filmed and will be available in January on the library's YouTube channel, Author Playlist. Books are available for sale and signing, thanks to our bookseller, Eagle Eye Bookshop. A percentage of the sales is donated to the library to support these events. There will be time for questions and answers at the end of her talk. Beginning around 7.30 p.m., you will hear overhead announcements about the closing of the branch. Please ignore them. The branch will be open until we are done with tonight's program. And now, we are honored to host author Roya Hakakian. Her new book is A Beginner's Guide to America for the Immigrant and the Curious. The book provides insights into the immigrant experience from the perspective of a political refugee from revolutionary Iran and an examination of how immigrants contribute to American culture and civic life. Roya Hakakian is the author of two books of poetry in Persian and numerous essays and articles in publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and NPR. She emigrated to the United States in 1985. Hakakian is a founding member of the Human Rights Documentation Center and has been a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars and the recipient of the, Guggen of the Guggenheim Fellowship for nonfiction for her book, Assassins of the Turquoise Palace. Her memoir, Journey from the Land of No, won Elle Magazine's Reader's Choice Award. Please help me welcome Roya. Hello, everyone. Um, I hate being late, but uh, I didn't know how big, at, I should know that Atlanta is very big, but the distances seemed uh, shorter. Um, so I was very happy when, um, when uh, Denise contacted me and Laura had read my book. Um, and, um, and so the reason I wrote this book, I don't know how many of you know it, is because um, even though I've been a naturalized citizen for uh, 30 plus years um, and nothing, no threat to any immigrant community should worry me, but I found myself incredibly surprised in 2016 when um, all sorts of things were being said on national television and radio about immigrants and which ones are the good ones and which ones are the bad ones and which ones we want more of and which ones should stay the hell away and things like that. And, and what really surprised me was that all of that really offended me. And I was sitting there thinking, why should it? You know, I'm, I came here a long time ago. Um, I have spent most of my life in the United States I should be comfortable. I'm I'm one of them. Any you know I'm I'm not. I none of this should offend me. None of this should worry me. I'm I'm a U.S. citizen. But every time I heard, um, why don't we have more Norwegians in America as opposed to, you know, people from those countries, I thought, oh, you know, and then. Of course, it was mentioned in my introduction that I come from Iran, and Iran was one of the five countries that was placed under ban. Interestingly enough, um, the program through which I came to the United States, um, which was based in Austria um, through an organization called the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, it's, a, it's an organization that sponsors um, persecuted uh, people from around the world, whether from any religious community, if they're persecuted, Hayas sponsors them um, and brings them to the United States and they become 
uh, refugees. So um, the program that had brought me shut, had to shut down uh, because, it, you know, Hayas couldn't uh, operate under the whole idea that um, Iran was under ban because the ban somehow didn't distinguish between persecuted minorities. And so <laughs> uh, I thought, well, the program that brought me uh, here has been shut down. Uh, there is a ban on, on the country where I come from, so nobody can get in. And then thirdly, I think this was the last straw, I heard um, that one day, uh, whether it was the former president or it was one of the discussions that I was hearing, that um, people who don't speak English should not be allowed to come in. Uh, and I thought, well, I was 18. I spoke no English um, when, I, when I came to the United States first. And, um, and somehow that really shook me up, that I thought, you know, who, not even I could have ever imagined that after, you know, 20 plus 30 years of being in this country, um, I have managed to publish three books in English, um, and I was the one who came with no English at all. So um, after all this, I thought I have to somehow be the voice of the immigrant. I have to speak on behalf of the immigrant. I have to um, somehow um, make a plea to people who were hearing all this and were being influenced uh, by it one way or another. Um, but more importantly, I thought that I wanted to do it in a way that wouldn't get into any sort of political discussion on the left or the right. My issue wasn't to try to um, argue with one, you know, with the left or the right. Um, my effort, I thought, had to be focused on the idea of making the immigrant somebody that you can feel, somebody whose um, thoughts become accessible to the readers, whose feelings become accessible to the readers, whose anxieties, whose joys, all of those things that an immigrant, a new immigrant especially, uh, to this country experiences should become too ac accessible to the readers. And hopefully, when they do, then um, people who are non-immigrants in the country and are hearing uh, all sorts of things being said about the immigrant will be less inclined to be intimidated by the immigrant or uh, kind of buy into whatever it is that's being said. So what I try to do is just that. The book isn't an anti-immigrant or a pro-immigrant book. The book is, a, is about making the, the immigrant accessible to everybody. Um, I hope. And I try to do it in a, in a way that would be most disarming, that would, um, that would, at a time when we were hearing that immigrants are coming in and they are committing various crimes in this country, um, whereas really um, most immigrant communities, especially the ones that are closest to the borders, prove to have been some of and are some of the safest communities in the country. So they can't be um, the ones who are, you know, uh, committing crimes or else, you know, the crime rates in those communities would be higher than they are and they're not. Um, but I wanted to uh, make the immigrant um, human because I thought that the immigrant was being um, turned into something other than um, an accessible person, but most importantly, uh, human, that the humanity of the immigrant was being uh, taken away. So um, another thing that the book tries to do in order not to fall to the left of the arguments or the right of the arguments, but uh, just make a human pitch on behalf of the immigrant, 
um, is to actually not use a first person voice, which would have then made the book sound like a memoir and somebody who picks it up would easily say, well, it's just one person's account and you know, we can't make any sort of you know, grand announcements by the use of just one person's memoir. Um, it's not, not also written in the third person because I thought I didn't want it to sound like another piece of journalism or reportage on this state of immigrants in the country. I didn't want it to sound like the newspaper or the radio. So the book is written like a cookbook. It's speaking to you, giving you, the readers, instructions. And therefore, it sounds and reads um, how it's intended in the second person. And I thought, you know, let's, let's mix things up a little. Let's uh, make it, uh, you know, make the, the immigrant or, or someone who's transplanted and comes here obviously um, has had to become slightly, if not more than slightly, uncomfortable by this experience. And so uh, the reader should also be slightly jarred by picking up something and reading something that doesn't read like ordinary prose in the first or the, or the third person. Some people have really liked that voice. Um, others have criticized it, but you know, hopefully I'll read a short passage and you'll make your own decisions. But, but the title of the book is um, A Beginner's Guide to America um, for the Immigrant and the Curious. The curious are the rest of us who are non-immigrants. And so the book, even though it sounds like it's addressing the immigrants, um, in some ways uh, truly has been written um, for the non-immigrant Americans, for, um, for people who uh, were the targets of so much of uh, the political uh, campaigning, anti-immigrant campaigning for the last several years. Um, I, I wanted, as I mentioned, uh, for the book to be as disarming as possible um, again, I said I didn't want I didn't want this story to get lost um, in in political debate, but that to hit the immigrant to become human, um, and and in that way I didn't want to directly uh, say or own up to the fact that in many ways the book was intended for the non-immigrant Americans, but I. Um, mention the non-immigrant in, in the title of the book as the curious. And, and as a result, many people who are non-immigrants who have read the book have told me that through the perspective of the narrator of this book, they're managing to see an America that they were not able to see before. That somehow uh, the perspective of the naturalized immigrant um, who, who narrates the entire book has given them an opportunity to examine and look at this country where they've been born and raised in a fresh and, and you know, unprecedented way. So if you are an immigrant, I hope you identify with many aspects of the book. If you are a curious person who's been born and raised in this country, I hope the book gives you an opportunity to see things about the country and appreciate certain things that may not be obvious to you because they have always been here. This was truly um, something that I didn't initially decide to do, but, but somehow came along the way that I thought, you know, um, perhaps immigrants aren't just here in the United States to do the jobs that the rest of us don't want to do. Perhaps um, immigrants are meant more than just um, staff uh, the hospitals or the nursing homes or take care of our children or you know, um, do, you know, um, pick our fruits in the farms, um, you know, uh, in the south or in, uh, in California. Uh, perhaps 
There is one more reason why we need immigrants at this particular time in this country, and that reason may well be that while we are in some ways forgetting why our democracy is as important as it is, it is the immigrant through whose perspective we get to see an America that the immigrant can appreciate in ways that those who've been born and raised here can't because they have not been elsewhere, they don't have another experience under uh, a non-democratic order, they don't know what it's been like for the rest of us and why it is that we cherish certain things about how things work here that the rest of you may not. Um, so that's it. You know, I, I really thought, you know, here's a chance for uh, everybody else who takes democracy for granted, who, you know, uh, finds it easy these days to uh, be worried and therefore, you know, take extreme measures as far as, you know, um, their ideologies are concerned. Um, it, it's also, the book is also a plea for, um, for those who haven't had uh, an immigrant experience, for those who have not been um, the, the ex who have not been exposed to a non-democratic system to see America through the perspective of the rest of us and begin to realize why uh, some of the foundational uh, values and principles that we have um, are worth fighting for and improving and, and spreading. And, and so, um, it came as much of a surprise to me um, at the end to find that even though I wanted to um, make a plea on behalf of the immigrant, but I discovered in the process myself that I was also making a plea on behalf of uh, American values. And I you know, was also making a plea um, to all of us to begin to see um, why uh, why the rest of us were flocking here and are still coming here. And even though it may seem that uh, we're coming here for uh, a better life, we are also coming here because of the, vet the better um, life conditions that are here and, and the democratic order is chief among them. So I kept talking about the voice in the book and how uh, I made it sound uh, different than a piece of journalism you might come across or um, a first-hand account um, of an immigrant. I, um, and, and so I have talked at length about the voice in the book, so I want to give you a feeling of what that vo voice sounds like. Um, this is a short passage Um, from, or maybe I should just take the actual book. Thank you. Thank you. So the first chapter of the book actually is when the immigrant arrives, you know, lands and begins to look at America, you know, what the immigrant finds in um, in that first encounter. And then as you go forward, it's um, about signing up in the ESL class and, you know, going to do those routine initial things. And, and part of this uh, passage that I want to read is, um, is, is those first encounters with the immigrants. Um, when one of the things that we all do, all of us, including the Uber driver who brought me tonight was, where are you from? Uh, Roya isn't an American name. Where are you from? And and so I thought um, um, I should um, I should somehow reflect on my own experience with with where are you from? Um, because we have heard, or at least I have heard, many things about why you shouldn't ask people 
uh, where they're from or why you should. And I, in this short passage, I try to, um, I try to make a pitch for why it's okay to ask, but it's also important to know how that question lands um, emotionally with, with someone who's brand new. So, um, so here's, here's the brand new immigrant who uh, has just arrived uh, and, and the landlord or the uh, caregiver in the, in the apartment building has come to visit her or him. And um, so the, that landlady or land, uh, well, in this case, it's a landlord, asks, where are you from? And there, you have arrived at the most vexing four words of your early days in America. Your reaction to this will be, above all, one of alarm. Your immediate thought will be that your pleasant manner has failed. After all, he has found you out, knows that you're not from here. You take it to mean that you do not belong, and if you have a particularly gloomy nature, you worry that you can never belong. Even after years of being here and trying to fit in, your accent or something else about you will always give you away, and the question with a minor variation can still haunt you, where are you really from? When you're new and you are as you are on that first morning, anxiety explains things before reason does. But in time, you will see that there are as many interpretations for those four words as there are words for snow for Eskimo. Asking where you are from can often simply be a way of breaking the proverbial ice. You might say, I'm from Thailand, to which the person asking the question could, in turn, excitedly say, my housekeeper is Thai. Or, I love drunken noodles. You might not be um, fond of your national cuisine, but no matter. Where are you from is launched into the conversation only to further the introduction. Even the native born ask each other the same question just to get acquainted. Sometimes it might lead to a wistful memory. You're the spitting image of my cousin Matty. May he rest in peace, or if the person asking is a single man or woman in pursuit of love. The following can ensue. If everyone in your country looks like you, I know where I must go for my next vacation. Such lines are most common at watering holes and nightclubs. However, an encounter with a freshly arrived immigrant can have a dis disarming effect, not unlike that of alcohol. In truth, and especially in those early days, where are you from is prone to cause more trouble than good. If you come from a communist or an anti-American stronghold, you worry that the person asking might be wondering about your allegiances. If you come from a country in the throes of civil strife, you fear he might suspect that you have fought on the wrong side of the conflict. If you are from a nation with a record of fist pumping and sword brandishing in front of the television cameras, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, for example, sometimes he wishing to confirm the place of your origin might run his hand across his neck to sign a beheading. That is when you realize that a meat cleaver is now shorthand for your ancient civilization. In the early days after your arrival, where are you from is, above all, a reminder of your unpreparedness to speak of the past. You have yet to shape your story, what you saw, why you left, how you left, and what it took to get here. This narrative is your personal book of Genesis, the American volume, the one you will sooner or later pen in the mind, if not on the page. You must take your time to do it well and to do it justice. And then, and then I say that when to give the straight answer to where are you from is, uh, is only half the dilemma. 
The other is the response that it often elicits from the person asking, which is likely to be, you must be glad you're here. And though you are glad that you're here, at that moment, you do not want your odyssey simply summarized and punctuated with mere gladness. There's certainty and expectation that you ought to be glad and grateful irritate you. Your instant reaction is to be unglad and ungrateful. You are fully aware how horrid were the circumstances, the land you left behind, but it was the land on whose grounds you had learned to walk, under whose sun you had warmed. You can denigrate that land because you and it are, however bitterly, inseparable. Strangers cannot, if they do, they would denigrate you too. So, that's it. I will take questions. Thank you. Okay. Is this? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you do you miss Iran and why or why not? I don't. It's a strange thing to say. But, but on the other hand, I spend part of every day reading about it, you know, following the news. So I guess uh, part of the beauty of social media, if it, if it can be described as beautiful, is, is that you, know, you, you keep up um, in ways that you couldn't before. Um, so in some ways, I live in it. I, I still know about it. But the fact is that everything I had and, and I was close to, um, you know, my school, my, you know, I, I'm Jewish, and so the Jewish community has gone from, you know, is now a tenth of its original size. Um, so, so many things that I um, knew back then it simply aren't there anymore. So uh, if I miss anything, it's not people I knew or places I knew, because almost none of those things exist anymore. Um, but it's a, it's a sense of uh, attachment to the language, um, to the culture, that I try to somehow recapture by, you know, by reading and by being somehow engaged via you know, the various uh, avenues that I can find. And these days, it's mostly social media. So, yes. Uh, like you, I am uh, an immigrant. Here. Yes. Uh, I came here when I was 17. Uh -huh. I'm from Iran. Yes. Uh, I happen to be from Jewish state. Uh -huh. uh, I came here in 1977. And even though I was very young, yeah. and that time there were no crises in Iran yet, I had come here to go to architectural school and uh, educate myself to go back and take, uh, you know, benefit from all those uh, fruitful opportunities that at that time were going on in Iran. And it was a time that uh, Americans and Iranians were very fond of each other. Yes, that's right. They really felt, uh, I could say, they mostly, uh, I don't know if the word love is too strong, but they were very fond of each other. It's very unfortunate what took place. Yes. But uh, even though I was 17, I was so fond of Iranian literature mm -hmm. and the poetry mm -hmm. uh, that as much as I love this country and I consider myself very lucky with all the atrocities that are taking place in that place, which turn the heavenly place the way I think of it, I hope I don't offend anybody into a hell. Uh, but I still love the culture, not mm -hmm. not what's going on now, what it was. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, like a lot of Americans are exposed to Rumi mm -hmm. and uh, his poems and his sayings and. Uh, it's very deep, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't. I don't think I can ever separate myself from from all because that because 
it's like blood running in my veins uh -huh. and I feel like I'm like a bird that now has uh, two homes, you know, mm -hmm. uh, really two homes and at least this one is accessible and I can enjoy it but so no matter how broken or luxurious or I don't know happy or unhappy at times home is since you were born there as you said you you know uh, I not as uh, good as you with the words that you use as a very bright rider you know like the warmth of the sun over there, you know, uh, the air, yes. some of the uh, friends that you had. As I said, at least United States is accessible, but those are not really accessible. So it's just you always have the longing for it. Yes. But you, it seems like you can never really feel feel it. Anymore. Recapture it. And That's it's true. Very very important. I can understand. Thank you for that. Um, I take questions or I can, yes? Um, you said that you value American values and uh, which value you would uh, bring first? Uh, American well, value, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, egalitarianism. You know, I come from a place where um, at least for the last five, six years that I was in Iran, I couldn't decide what to wear. It was decided for me, you know. So I like the fact that, and I think this is part of what we take for granted, it is a miracle that we can walk out dressed the way we wish, because it's not so everywhere else in the world. And I know this sounds almost you know, trivial or uh, unimportant to, to those of us who have always had this, but it is a miracle. And, and it's small miracles like this that need protection. The fact that you and I can sit here and no one will, you know, run a surveillance to know what it is that we are discussing, that um, we can talk about whatever we want. We should worry about what we put into our computers, but at least uh, to this day we can continue to have our own conversations and disagree. Um, so these are, these are the values that I really care about. I also care about the fact that um, you know, it made me, um, you know, truly, it moved me to see, um, you know, last week, um, the Ahmad Arbery uh, uh, verdict come forward. Um, not only, uh, you know, whatever else may have happened, the idea that this is a nation that can look at its past and and engage with its mistakes and the things that it realizes need correcting is important. Um, I come from a place where we couldn't have those conversations. I come from a place where we couldn't look back and say, you know, we committed errors and let's think about what those mistakes were, what those wrongdoings were, and can we have a conversation about those things. So, you know, it's not to say that things are perfect here. Of course they're not. But it's just to remind us all that as long as we can have a conversation about those things, um, we're better off than most other places on the planet. And that, those are the things, you know, the idea of open conversation, the idea of being able to continue to be engaged are the things that I think the curious uh, need to be reminded of. Yes. So if you were a, a new immigrant in 2021, what do you think your biggest challenges would be? I think some of it, and fortunately, this is the good news, um, there has always been an immigrant community, if not one, if not two or three, at least there has always been one immigrant community that has been unwelcome. And history shows that after a generation of, or two or three, they have always eventually fit in and been welcomed. So, so there, is, there has throughout American history always been at least one immigrant community that has been ostracized and, and 
uh, you know, we have wished them away. You know, there, there were Germans that Benjamin Franklin didn't want in this country because he thought they were too stupid to learn anything. Too stupid to learn English, he thought. Um, there were, you know, there was the Chinese Exclusion Act. We didn't want the Chinese. So, so I think to answer your question, uh, it, it depends on which immigrant community, unfortunately, as it has always been. So I, I assume it would be much harder to be, you know, Latin American these days. Um, but I think if, you know, one of the things that I say in the book is that we can also take heart from the fact that all the other immigrant communities that were unwelcome initially were eventually welcomed. That, you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act is a, is a wonderful example of how much we resisted incorporating and allowing Chinese immigrants to become part of our society and, you know, voila, you know, things are not, uh, you know, they're not exactly equal citizens in some places because, you know, people discriminate against them. I shouldn't say they're not equal citizens. They are equal citizens by law, of course. But, you know, in the past year or so, we have uh, seen evidence of others discriminating against them. But, but it's a long way from Chinese Exclusion Act to where we are today. So I think it depends on which immigrant community. And I think reminding ourselves that, yes, we have been, we have misbehaved as a nation and we have mistreated certain immigrant communities, but we have also learned. And, and, and hopefully we will be kinder and better to other immigrant communities. That said, I think there is, there is a serious issue here that most of us don't want to think about, which is that no matter how kind we even choose to be, and, and how open-hearted we decide to be to accept more and more immigrants. The crises that, that um, we are besieged by, um, including the environmental crisis above all, will uproot people from their own countries and communities. And, and, those are the cr and in order for us to address a major part of what's going on at the border or you know the the caravans that come to us um, is to address those crises so that people can continue to live where they are that i think we keep thinking that if we are kinder and and open up more um, we will just go back to the, the way things were we will incorporate more and more immigrants but i think the reality that we forget is that um, it takes more than open-heartedness to, to house all the massive numbers that are and will be uh, moving because of various crises. And I think um, part of what we need to identify as, as a problem uh, and not define them as immigration issue is, is those problems that originally move them. And I think environment, you know, m most parts of Latin America are becoming um, impossible to farm in, and so those farmers have to go elsewhere. So um, it's, a, it's a long way of answering your question, but I think, um, I think part of what makes us worry about you know, the arrival of immigrants to America is that more and more of them are coming. And I think um, we can't blame it on uh, you know, this administration or that administration or hope that any wall or laws even can prevent them from arriving. And I think the bigger question is, what can we do um, in order to make them uh, stay or make them go on with the lives that they had? And I think that's really the, the bigger issue here that we... Shall we? I can take one more question, or we can call it a night. Whatever you say. I, I, I listened. I'm listening to you speak. Yes. And I listened to your voice speak through your writing. Yes. And it was, to me, it was it was lyrical. Uh -huh. I think about language. Mm 
and, yeah, yeah. and listening to your voice. Um, one of the things when you talked about language and, and ESL classes, yeah. um, and I found it fascinating that you made the statement that about enrolling in ESL classes. Yeah. When it's good, but it's better in the long run to to speak yeah. and and to listen with native speakers. And I think that particularly here we have we have a lot of um, English language learners uh -huh. that people are afraid yes. um, for ridicule or um, or negative reactions, misunderstanding. Um, could you kind of explain? Well, actually, it's funny. I, I mentioned ESL classes. I hated them, and I, I, I didn't take them. I went once or twice, and then I just washed my hands off of them. And I, um, I, I went to Brooklyn College in New York, um, and, and the person, the advisor who was um, registering me said, well, you know, you, your entrance, English entrance tests, the TOEFL test, um, I don't test of English as a foreign language, your scores were very, were very poor. And I said, please, 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 I beg you, let me take a regular English class. Uh, it was Composition 101, and I will come through. And, and so he said, I'll take a chance and let you do what you want to do, but you better not mess up. And by the end of the semester, my essay was the essay that they put in the school pamphlet as you know, sample essay for other kids to do. I, I'm not a genius, but, but I, I, um, I entirely agree with you that I think, um, and, and my life's example it was that you know, ESL was the pits. You, know, you, you listen to other people who are mispronouncing things worse than you are, or as well as you are, or as poorly as you are. And so it was, it was uh, a bad thing. But I think it's, uh, it's also equally terrifying to, to hear from people who say, I beg your pardon? I beg your pardon? I mean, it, it's, it's very, I mean, it's a, it's a natural thing to say, but it's, but it's also painful. So I think, um, I think you're right, but um, if we can be, uh, as, a, as a people, we can be kinder toward people who don't speak as fluently as the rest of us, then maybe it becomes easier for them to, to speak, you know, or to take chances. Or on the other hand, for people who are, um, because we have a large Spanish speaking population, yeah. and I had my high school Spanish, which was more than five years ago. Yeah. Um, and so for me to try to improve my Spanish by speaking with them, right. it's terrifying for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, somebody asked me at, at, a, at another talk, you know, aren't you worried that Americans will f are no longer speaking English? And I said, no. I would worry if Americans who come, if people who come to this country don't believe in you know, equality of man and woman. I would worry if they didn't believe that, um, you know, all religious practices were welcome. Uh, I wouldn't worry if they spoke with an accent or spoke imperfectly. So this is my way of saying that I don't think language should worry us. It, it's an enriching experience, whether you, you know, they, you know, new immigrants try to learn more English or we try to learn more of their languages. Uh, we all get enriched by the process, but but language is not what where we should worry, and language is not what we should focus on. Uh, we should focus on whether or not they believe in the fundamental values that make America distinct. And I think democracy is the most important one. And I know you want me to stop, so I'll stop. Thank you. We have some door prizes. Door prize? For, well, for the guests. Yes. For the guests. Okay. Maria Cortez. Maria. Uh, Yay! And from the Friends of the Library. Thank you. We have another gift from the Friends of the Library. This is their president, Corliss. Feel free to talk to her after. We would love to have you join the Friends. Yan Kyung Lee Su. Yeah. 
And if you see them sit over there, I'm just going to... Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm Denise with Gwinnett County Public Library. We really appreciate your coming this evening in the call to be with us. Uh, and this is a phenomenal lady. Uh, I hope that you will consider buying her book and getting it signed. We also have book plates if you want to buy more gifts for, for gifts for people that you know. But this lady flew in today on her nickel to be here tonight. And that is an extremely impressive thing. So please at least take time to thank her. We welcome you, if you have a book, to come on over and have it signed or to meet her. Books are for sale over there with Eagle Eye Bookshop. Thank you for Eagle Eye. Thank you to Laura Dobbins for her introduction. Thank you to the friends for manning the door. And thank you to you for coming out this evening.